Sometimes stories will come with a, a very strong voice, in which case I know somebody's telling it and that's it's going to be first person or kind of a third person attached thing. You know, I, I think it's it's kind of what effect I want to create. And I, th- I think part of it also has to do with length. I think doing a short story in omniscient point of view is going to be hard to pull off. But, you know, like omniscient point of view at length, you can just do so much with. It's it, And it's a little bit like, if you think about it in terms of a camera, right, in, in, in kind of in, in television or movies or whatever, first person is that camera either right behind the, cam- the narrator's eyes or else it's watching them closely. Uh, second person is, is kind of like imposed by looking out from the POV character's eyes, which is kind of weird, right, we, in a very video game sensation. And third person attached is the camera watching the POV character very closely or maybe a little distantly. But omniscient point of view is the camera doing whatever the F it wants in order to tell the story. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 125 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn. How you doing, MJ? I am doing wonderful. How are you? Doing snazzy. And what's even snazzier are MJ's books, uh, Among Thieves, this beautiful blue baby. Just, uh, uh, and then, and then the sequel, Thick SDs, which just turned one, not like at the time they were recording, but very recently, uh, turned one year old. So one year old, you can go pick up these. I have a one year old and a three year old. Adrian knows how that feels. (laughs) Only with actual humans. It's chaos. But MJ's books are also chaos. So you're in good, you're in good hands. (laughs) (laughs) Just contained in pages. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Contained chaos. If you want to support Adrian, you could check out Mushroom Blues, which is six months old as of recording. Look at that. Yeah. So many birthdays happening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for your dose of fungal punk and murder and mystery and mayhem, check it out. And mold. And mold. And, and mutilation. So much mold. <laughs> <laughs> as well, a quick note for everyone out there listening or watching the official SFFX Patreon and merch store are live. So check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and view the podcast and subscribe to the FanFiatic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now joining us once again is the wonderful Kat Rambo, author of the Disco Space Opera series and much more, including Rumor Has It, which is out now, so go support their work. Welcome back, Kat. How are you doing? Oh, nice to be back. Nice to have you back. And I'm very, very excited today because we're talking about omniscient narration. But first, this is part two of our two-part chat with Kat, so I recommend checking out part one to get to know them better. And now we're going to dive into omniscient narration and point of view, uh, which is great because Kat suggested this, which means they're very, very uh, well-versed in omniscient. And the Disco Space Opera series is entirely an omniscient point of view. So let's just kick this off uh, and... Maybe there are some readers, uh, listeners and viewers out there who don't really know exactly what omniscient narration is, especially as it relates to fiction. But if you could give like a little bit of an overview for them. Absolutely. So third person omniscient point of view is a point of view where the narrator is not involved in the plot. Uh, It's very different from first person where the main character is narrating the story. And in Omniscient, you've actually got a narrator who's an unknown entity, usually, uh, who seems to have an omnipresent or all-knowing understanding of the characters in plot. And that means that the narrator's point of view is, a narrator's view of the story is not limited by any single character's experience. So you can basically be in one character's head and then bip over and find out what another character thinks of them. And do you have some examples, at least like favorites? Uh, from fiction of this kind of narration style? I do. I do. I have. uh, So one would be uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is omniscient point of view. Uh, The Discworld books by Terry Pratchett. Uh, Peter S. Beagle's The Last Unicorn. Uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's Good Omens. Uh, Jane Austen is omniscient point of view. Wrinkle in Time. 
uh, Wizard of Earth Sea, and uh, The Hobbit. And uh, yeah. Dune, Dune is a particular favorite of mine. Dune is well. another Dune. Um, yes. MJ, do you have any that come to mind for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but that's perfect. That's perfect, though, because it's like. Yeah, I was say, like, Hitchhiker's Guide is one that I thought of, uh, and then Good Omens as well. Um, but I do think it's, you know, uh, when I think of omniscient narration, a lot of the examples that I think of are a little bit older a lot of the time, right? Mm-hmm. More, you know, and it was really dominant, I think, uh, until 20th century-ish. But in kind of more modern styles, I feel, or stories, I think a lot of uh, writing has moved away, even into first person, I think, really. I mean, it's still having a moment, but I think first person mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. had a moment in like the early aughts. Um why do you believe that omniscient narration has kind of maybe fallen aside in, in terms of popularity? And do you think it can make a comeback? Well, one thing I blame is writing workshops and the fact that people saying, oh, you can't head hop is one of the rules that you learn early on. And it is one of the things that, that people will, will ding you for. Uh, so, so I think, I, I, and I, I mean, it sounds kind of snarky, but I do think we got kind of trained a, away from it and got to thinking of it as old fashioned. But I think it, it kind of it, it slid over into humor. And so you do have Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, or Cat Valente's uh, new series. If you've read Space Opera and then Space Oddity are omniscient point of view. And there's something about omniscient point of view that lends itself beautifully to humor. I mean, just absolutely beautiful because you can be ironic all over the place, right? Um, And so will it come back into sort of more serious writing? I don't know. Um, I I think that we have become used to having a character that we identify with uh, who's kind of our point of view character, and and particularly uh, television often does that. And I think we're just used to having kind of we're used to that comfortable skin of here's my character, and I walk around in the story for a while, and it's a different experience. If like you know, oh, now I'm I'm being dangled at ten thousand feet above the story, observing, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the like the training training readers and training viewers uh, about what they connect with and what kind of disconnects them mm-hmm. from a story. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I didn't never thought about the, like I haven't done a, a writing workshop um, or anything like more in an academic sense outside of university. Um, but university definitely trained me to yeah. go through periods of uh, history and, and the history of literature and oh, yeah. to kind of understand this progression. And I think Maybe it has something to do with the way that that the education system, especially in countries like North America, kind of burn you out on certain parts of like the literature spectrum. Oh, yeah. Uh, and especially where it's like you're in high school and you're like, oh, fuck me. I don't want to read any more Jane Austen or anything like that. <laughs> and you kind of associate uh, oh, yeah. the feeling that you have with certain types of literature. And it oh, yeah. even boils down to something like point of view and the narration oh, yeah. style. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I, th- I think that high schools for decades now have been teaching children that poetry is dull, which is, I just, I think a terrible, terrible lesson, but they do, they do teach them that. Yeah. It's like all the wrong lessons about literature. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's why so many people I talk to, I, uh, have a TikTok series where I recommend books to people based on their favorite video game. And I have so many comments that are like, oh my gosh, this got me back into reading. This is the first thing I've read since high school because, oh, and, that's, that's and I'm like, yes, come back dude. into the fold. Um, but like, I think there are, there is so much of that, right? Because people think of reading as a chore um, when, yeah, yeah, when yeah. they have to read a bunch of stuff that's not for them as a reader. Yeah. Um, I mean, my brother, yeah. when my book came out, he's like, I'll wait for the audiobook," And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like I, okay. I love your I love your honesty. <laughs> Thanks, dude. That's true, right? Yeah. At least you know when he tells you that he's read it, he ain't lying. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like I listened to it on the way to work. Thank you. Um so there are certain types of stories. You mentioned humor and how that kind of lends itself really well to omniscient. And I agree with that because humor is a multifaceted experience. Uh and if you can get more perspectives on the same situation that actually Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. helps to elevate 
uh, the humor in a lot of ways. But how do you when let's say like you're starting a story and and you're thinking, OK, like what perspective do I want to uh, write this in? How how might you know that omniscient is kind of like the best approach for a particular story? I think for me, that's partially going to be about voice, because sometimes stories will come with a, a very strong voice, in which case I know somebody's telling it and that's it's going to be first person or kind of a third person attached thing. Um Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, it's it's kind of what effect I want to create. And I, th I think part of it also has to do with length. I think doing a short story in omniscient point of view is going to be hard to pull off. And, and now I want to write it because it would be hard <laughs> to pull off. You challenge yourself. Yeah. Right? You're challenge. like, wait a second. <laughs> make a note here. Um, but, you know, like omniscient point of view at length, you can just do so much with. It's it, And it's a little bit like, if you think about it in terms of a camera, right, and 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 kind of in, in television or movies or whatever, first person is that camera either right behind the, cam the narrator's eyes, or else it's watching them closely. Uh, second person is, is kind of like imposed by looking out from the POV character's eyes, which is kind of weird, right? We then a very video game sensation. And third person attached is the camera watching the POV character very closely, or maybe a little distantly. But omniscient point of view is the camera doing whatever the f it wants in order to tell the story. And it really, I, I we didn't clear ahead of time whether or not I could swear, so I'm being. Oh, you we can swear. swear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We've been we've been swearing. Yeah, we You're should probably approved. MJ. We should probably tell guests ahead of we time. We should let people know that because yeah, people will get a little bit in. It's like and you're not swearing. Know. Am I allowed to swear? Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. You What's the rules here? Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's partially is, you know, human beings love patterns we love consuming patterns we love making patterns and uh omniscient point of view lets you do some really complicated cool patterns i like the framing well, patterns i know i say let's build on that a little bit and talk about challenges and benefits because i think when i think of omniscient third person uh the first thing i think is like God, that's hard. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, I, I think that it is in my mind, at least, and maybe this isn't a common conception, but it's it's certainly my impression of it is that it's one of the most challenging ones to get right. And we've kind of touched on it a little bit, uh, talking about the, the writing workshops telling us we're head hopping. And I do think that sometimes it can feel like head hopping if you get omniscient narration yeah. wrong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Let's talk. I mean, you've you've edited a lot of works. You've put together anthologies and things. Have you have you read examples of omniscient narrative or narration done poorly? Uh, what do people tend to get wrong? What doesn't well, work? Okay. okay. Doesn't yeah, I, I think if they're super uneven, it's like suddenly they're way down deep in the character's head to the point where they're like we're getting childhood moments, and then other no other character you know kind of gets touched on that way. Um, I think that can be disconcerting. And, and I, I think it basically it, it's create a pleasing pattern. But I mean, one of the best pieces of advice I've read about kind of treating it when you're writing it is, is treat it like you're telling a friend the plot of a movie. And you can kind of you can make educated guesses at characters, thoughts and feelings, but you can't really sort of dive way deep and say, yes. And when he was six years old, this happened. Right. That's something that would would be better suited to a different point of view yeah so it's like you can give like a broader overview i don't know why like lord of the rings just came into my mind where it's like you'd be like and then legolas and aragorn and gimli were running across the 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 hills of rohan and in, in search of in search of the hobbits and yeah. and frodo and sam were off with Gollum, uh and they were you know heading to mordor and that kind of thing where it's like you can give i like um like Going back to the pattern thing, it's like creating a consistent pattern that gives the reader a sense that everyone is kind of like on equal footing um, yeah. in terms of like their importance as characters. Yeah. So it's kind of like using Disco Space Opera as an example. It's like you have Captain Nicolette and then you have the other members of uh, the restaurant turn uh, bio ship, uh, you sexy thing. And you feel like 
Yes, Captain Nico was the first person whose head you were in. Um, but after that, you get a lot of even sort of um, page time with mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. of the different characters. And, and so I wanted to kind of talk about benefits now in terms of what you think are some, if you play it right, uh, what are some ways that an omniscient narrator can enhance the story and elevate it that wouldn't be possible with other narrative styles? Well, I think one of the most obvious is you can have one character have an interpretation of a thing, and then you can have another character have a different interpretation of a thing. And you can have those wonderful moments where somebody is like trying desperately to communicate something to somebody else who hears something entirely different than what is meant, right? Um, and, and that's, for me, this works very well with the spaceship because the spaceship is always thinking to itself and the spaceship, you know, a spaceship is doing things like, well, yeah, if I killed one of them, they would notice, you know, and it's that sort of, you know, just, and, and I, I modeled the spaceship actually after a cat that I used to have who had huge amounts of personality it was not the smartest cat I've ever had, but was definitely the biggest personality and I, I just I, I love writing the ship for that reason, because you can just have so much fun where somebody says something and the ship is like, well, let me misinterpret that. And it, it, that's that's, I think, one of the biggest uh, advantages. But the, uh, the uh, another thing is that sometimes you want to show more than one character is capable of seeing. Um I do have it. One of the reasons I get very irritated about the head hopping advice is I had a short story that came out, which uh, is basically it's this guy who's going to assassinate someone. And then at the end, his target assassinates him. And so the last minutes are in the, the target's point of view. And people were like head hopping. And I was like, well, how the fuck would you do it otherwise? <laughs> right. You know, it just. But I, like so, that, that reaction is you know, so frustrating too, right? That's it. Sometimes you need that that person standing over the dead body of the previous point of view, and it's it's okay. I mean, for one thing, it's your writing. You get to do whatever you want to do with it. You just have to make it an interesting enough pattern that it never bounces the reader out of the story. Yeah, and and maybe it's like. Uh... In this, in just a question, like in terms of how you frame that that transition, is it done in like a similar way to you, the way you've done it in disco space opera, where it's like that smooth omniscient transition, or is it like, you know, a lot of writers who will do uh, like a scene break, to, yeah, they'll do a scene break or they'll do a chapter mm -hmm. break to sort of create that. Divide. I had a scene break. I yeah. had an actual scene break setting this off. So I still... Well, that is extra yeah, that's not bullshit. head hopping. That's bullshit, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you gave signposts. <laughs> yeah. What do you want, -uh. people? <laughs> so the takeaway from everyone for this is just like, writers will remember reviews for like 10 years later and yeah. still be, be like, <laughs> man, they'll be salty about it. <laughs> <laughs> be salty oh until I gosh. die. Oh, right. Man. As is your right. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, let's talk about the narrative voice of the omniscient narrator a little bit. Cause you know, this is, I'm, I'm particularly interested cause I have not written this style before. I do like third person, but it's like third person closely following one, you know, and, I, mm -hmm. and I'll do multi POV. Um, and you know, setting the voice for that is really easy cause it's, the character that, you know, who I'm following that scene, right? That's what voice I'm writing in. When you're developing your omniscient narrator's voice, I mean, first of all, what's your processes for developing that? But also, how do you maintain a consistent voice when you are bouncing among different uh -huh. perspectives? Well, my first answer, my answer to the first question is not going to be helpful at all because it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it goes back to that idea uh, that I mentioned in the last time where with the first draft, you just write. And so I, I do just write and, and not, not worry about it in that. And I, I think that I can get away with that because I've read a lot of third person, of, of omniscient point of view. And so I can, I can speak with that particular accent or, you know, um, but then revision is is key 
in revision, you do want to go through and go, okay, how much stage time am I giving this person? Because you, you can't be like, okay, I'm going to give everybody, you know, 14.5% of the book, right? You know, it's just not going to work. But you do want to make sure that everybody has had a chance to kind of check in. And so one of the revision paths is, is me going through and saying, okay, well, okay, everybody's doing this. What's Lacite doing right now? Let's just check in on him. Uh, you know, what are, what are the twins up to right now? Let's, oh, look, they're tearing something up. How surprising, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> right. It's like their wear lines. Of course they're doing something mischievous, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but building on that, like, um, so I think, yeah, revision is a good, uh, sort of baseline for refining voice, uh, the voice of, of the omniscient narrator, uh, or I like, I like to call it like the storyteller. Um, uh-huh. I just did like from last episode, I imagine it's like the, the restaurateur in, in Spain who passed you a joint and told you ghost stories. He's <laughs> well, the omniscient there you narrator. Go. <laughs> um, the omniscient how, narrator of our lives, <laughs> of our lives, of our meal. How important is it that, um, you define the omniscient narrator in terms of like their voice, but having it such that they feel uh unique in and of themselves but at the same time that they're not like overimposing in yeah, the story, on the story. Uh, yeah that's that's tough because you can do something like in hitchhiker's to guide the galaxy where kind of you're really like well it's it's really the book telling this whole story right is is, is how it feels um i think that you want, I think you want to keep the narrator nameless. And, and I, I think that's important that you don't want the narrator kind of explaining why they're there it, because then they become a, a character and, and you do want kind of the narrator's presence to be sort of seamless, right? You don't want the narrator ever calling attention to themselves. You want them calling attention to things in the story and things about the characters. Um, so that would be, uh, I think, one of the things that I would think about with that. Yeah. Cause that, that, that to me is the most daunting aspect yes. of omniscient narration. Yeah. Cause MJ, I'm like, like, I don't, I don't find myself being like from the get go thinking omniscient narration, fuck, that's going to be hard. Um, it's kind of like there are certain intricacies of that narrative style that, that especially the, you know, head hopping isn't something that I'm, I'm like overly worried about, but I'm like, how do I make it so that this omniscient narrator is yeah. able to convey the story it's in an interesting way? And yet also yeah. fades back. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's kind of like this double, double play of being present, but also like invisible at the same time. And I, I think part of it is, is you want to make that those transitions between characters just absolutely invisible, but at the same time, not lose the reader. And so I think often like kind of leading with names is a good strategy, but also making sure that characters are distinctive and staying away from like segues from two characters who are like being too alike, you know, kind of like move, move between differences rather than similarities. This is something that I noticed in your, in your books um, that you mentioned the bio ship, uh, you sexy thing almost acts as like, even though the even though you sexy thing isn't necessarily the omniscient narrator, the ship acts as a sort of pseudo narrator in certain parts because it kind of provides these seamless transitions that you're talking yeah. about, yeah. where it doesn't feel as jarring because it's like you have yeah. this this in between sort of character, this in between voice yeah. that you can rely on to yeah. make that transition more comfortable. That's it. That's it. And, and because it's a distinctive one, it, it kind of it, it acts as a good boundary marker, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have any other well, like uh, tricks or anything like that for well, those kinds of transitions? I think, I think, well, let's see. I, I do think that it's one of the things where you sort of train the reader early. And so kind of like in your first chapter or in your first few pages, you know, do kind of establish what's kosher or what's not kind of set the, set the pattern up and be like, okay, we can go this deep into a character. Or we can, we, we go no deeper, uh, that, that, uh, sort of thing. Um, I think keeping the tone consistent 
I, I think if you start letting emotion seep in, so like your narr- your point of view is feeling emotion, then you're moving into a, a different POV. Yeah. Well, and that's, I want to dive into the characterization piece because you, you mentioned that you want to, when you're switching between POVs uh, or, you know, heads, minds, um, that you want to make sure there's a stark contrast. Uh, how are you building those really rich characters that feel well-rounded and feel uh, distinct from the perspective of that omniscient narrator? Well, I, I think part of it is when you get a chance to dip into a character, you do give a little bit about them. Uh, you know, you don't go deep into their backstory, but you do give an, enough, you know, of both them talking and maybe a little bit of their thinking and their actions uh, that it helps establish them. Um, and I think characters notice and focus on different things. Uh, so kind of like what somebody, what one character notices is going to be very different from what another character notices. And if you know the characters well, and the writer is kind of doing what they should be, you can probably predict, you know, like what, what is the character going to to look at or do or focus on? Is that kind of how you're balancing um, sort of internalization versus externalization for each character? Is yeah. like, you know, because intimacy, I think, is a, is, a, is a big part of why writers might be um, challenged by omniscient narration because we're, you know, like if you're used to writing third person sort of like close perspective or first person, um, those allow for a level of intimacy that really pulls the reader deep into like the psyche of that character. Um, But you're saying there's like kind of like sort of limits that you can uh, kind of Put in there or are there are different ways yeah. that you can convey that kind of information well I, I think one of the ways that you convey it is is that sort of intimacy is you do it in uh, conversation or kind of interactions between two characters and so rather than have a character remembering their backstory have them tell some of their backstory or another character tells someone else about their backstory uh, and sort of let the story live in the interactions between the characters less than inside the characters' heads. Let, let a great deal of the story kind of actually rest on that. Mm-hmm. And then ex- at the same time, what you're saying about like the way that they perceive their environments mm-hmm. or situations, uh, those are kinds of like external details uh, oh, yeah. that provide a little bit more contextual clues yeah. about that character and their yeah. background. Yeah. Yeah. And every, I mean, one of the things you also, I mean, the the whole thing about like every, you need to know what every character needs or what every character wants. I mean, that that really is true. It's, it's, it's good to kind of know what is somebody's go-to reaction for, for a lot of things. Um, You know, because when I'm panicked, I, I don't have like a range of 10 different behaviors that I exhibit. I usually kind of tend to do the same thing, which is, you know, like scream and throw my hands in the air. Right. You know, and, and so uh, yeah, let your characters demonstrate a little of themselves that way. Yeah. Cause I think that, I mean, regardless if you're doing omniscient or, or any other kinds of, there are, there are different ways in which you can, uh, just for writers out there, there are different oh, yeah. ways in which you can convey information about your characters. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, we say, uh, at the beginning, like writers workshops where they're saying like, don't head hop, don't head hop this old adage that everyone's heard, just like show, don't tell. There are so many different ways that you can yeah. play around well, with that. Yeah. Um, and you can I'll, go ahead. You can break all the rules. You just have to know that you're breaking them, right? You have a, a reason for breaking them. So yeah. And I think omniscient is actually kind of a cool playground for that, even though it feels so. <laughs> I don't know. Like maybe just because of like the 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 relationship I have in my head with it to older fiction Uh it feels that there's more stricture there but in reality there's so much yeah like there's so much there's so much flexibility there um because that's the part that makes it hard right yeah Yeah. because people are like i need i need limitations in order to guard rails yeah well that's true i mean like when you're, I mean, like we are, do these writing to prompt sessions, and one of the reasons we do them is is because if you have a prompt and sit down and start writing, you can start writing. Whereas sometimes if you're sitting down and you just got a blank page, you're just like, well, I don't know. 
And so, yeah, if you add limitations in often, I, I used to do with my students uh, when I was teaching composition, I they would come up with a list of 10 words and they would have to write a scene and try and get those 10 words into the scene. And they just did amazing stuff. And it was because they had had the, the kind of those constraints to play inside. So, yeah, omniscient is a huge blank canvas. And, yeah, it's powerful and frightening, but it's also super cool. Oh, my gosh. That, that exercise where you have to put specific words in to go back to, again, last episode, it's like it's like the chopped of writing exercises, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking Here of, are the uh, words in your basket. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I was thinking of, like, freestyle rap where, like, they'll have, oh. like – like rap battles where they'll oh, know, yeah. have like there some words go. that they'll try so to So what we're saying is chopped is the rap battle of the culinary world. Of the world. culinary world. Got there it. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect analogy. You got this, MJ. <laughs> well, while we're kind of going off the rails for stuff, let's uh, when we think of, of omniscient, obviously we think third person for the various characters. We're breaking rules. We're talking about rule breaking. Are there effective ways where if you're writing a third person omniscient, can you incorporate first, second person pieces? Oh, sure. Could you do a second person omniscient story? Like what's your take on that? You could absolutely do like a really cool novel where like it periodically broke into first person or second person or whatever. It's just like you you would want to do something where it happens sort of consistently as opposed to, yeah, I've got this novel and for some reason – the novel, the second chapter breaks into first person and then it never moves into first person again, right? And then you'd be like, you know, just if you're doing it enough that the reader thinks you're doing it for a reason as opposed to it looking accidental. Um, I just edited, <laughs> I just, a friend of mine sent me a story to edit and they accidentally messed up and included like 10 pages of their personal statement for this this thing. And I, you know, and I wrote back and I was like, so is this the story in its entirety, you know? And she's like, of course it's not. And I was like, well, no, sometimes people do stuff and you just, you want to be respectful of that. Uh, you know, there's, there's no reason not, I mean, it, it's good to experiment. It's, and it's good to encourage people to experiment. Um, I, I believe in encouraging them, but I want to know if they're experimenting as opposed to they're just sort of like spilling shit by accident. <laughs> It's like, yeah, thanks for double checking, you know? Right. Um, Because, yeah, I think think some of the most challenging stuff that I've read uh, in, you know, my adult life probably. Uh, I think, like, Jeff Andermere is probably one of the most uh, challenging because there are in, you know, I'm thinking of the Southern Reach trilogy where book one is very, very intimate uh, from the perspective of this biologist book two goes into second person and you're just like, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah. And, yeah. and I think a lot of people find, uh, those experiences quite jarring when they're confronted with, um, narration styles, points of view that they're not accustomed to, yeah. uh, especially when it comes to, you know, like you look at all the big New York Times bestselling books, majority of them are first person, third person, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of thing. And so when you can, when you're confronted with like, okay, this entire book is in second person, it almost takes like a little bit of a rewiring of the brain. It does. To... It does. And it's, it's a, I think it's a brilliant choice for kind of a series that is about kind of like weird alienation mm-hmm. and strange shit occurring. And then just, it really kind of gets you into the right mindset. Exactly. Do you, like, so there's like rewiring on the part of the reader as yeah. well. Yeah. Do you think there are some ways in which authors, writers listening, uh, some steps that they might be able to take in order to like rewire their brain to, Ooh, to like write third person, to write, omniscient? to write omniscient in general. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I, I would think, yeah. Read a bunch of weird experimental shit would be, <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, no, no kidding. I mean, I would read some, some kind of like wildly experimental stuff. I would, tackle Samuel Delaney's Dahlgren, which is, is wildly experimental, but I, I don't know that you'll get a, get all the way through it. Cause it is, it's kind of like the, the Finnegan's wake of science fiction, but uh, you know, read though, some, some, some read some weird shit and change things up. I think, you know, if you have a routine where every day you get up and you drink your coffee and you sit down at the desk and you write well, what happens if you get up and you go get a donut and you sit on the riverbank and write, you know, just kind of 
if you write by hand, try writing on the computer or, or vice versa. Try dictating it. Just change change your normal process up, and that will help you get out of any ruts you may have inadvertently wandered into. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's like my favorite thing is to switch how I'm writing. Like I switch and I'll write by hand if I get stuck. I've never tried dictation though. Like that, did have oh. you did you dictate any there's of, like a, of there's like a there's like a voice to isn't there like a voice to text on like most I phones? used I used oh, to use sure. I used to use Dragon Dictate, and in fact, a lot of uh, a lot of all of the uh, space operas has been written using dictation software. But uh, the Mac now has the capability to do that, so I don't need Dragon Dictate. But what I do if I'm really in the flow is I will move back and forth between two modes. And one mode is where you're just writing, right? And you're writing the words that are going to appear on the page. And then if I get stalled, I'll start writing what those words will be. Like, okay, then they're going to go into a, to the camp and they're going to build a campfire and somebody's going to jump out of the bushes and then somebody's going to say this. And if I'm doing that, then I find that flips me back eventually into the first mode and so if you really want to get a flow going, if you really want to kind of do like a 30 minute sprint and get this, you know, thousand, thousand or so words. Yeah, do that because it keeps you from getting stuck. That's actually very meta because you're the dictation yeah. process is almost you being the omniscient narrator yourself. I know. Yeah. That's, I was just thinking when you said dictation, I was like, I can see that being a really yeah. helpful style because you mm -hmm. described it as uh, uh, imagine you're telling your friend the plot of a movie, right? Yeah. And that's, I, I yeah. think that it could be helpful. So maybe that's great advice for, well, that, yeah, like you've that, never tried dictation listeners, give it a shot maybe. Yeah. But describing the movie to a friend is almost what you were saying there in terms of like, yeah. in order to overcome writer's block, you just get into that mode where you like, you don't have to get hyper detailed. Yep. You can just, just describe kind of what's going to happen. Yeah. Damn. Cause I think one of the things that happens often for people with writer's block is they're so worried that the words have to be good. And I had I do coaching sometimes with people, and I had a, a client a few years back where uh, they came, and their first story had done fabulously well. Uh, it had won you know awards and appeared on best of lists, and, and I and they're like uh, I need help, uh, and and I said, well, what have you written since you wrote that story? And they were like nothing, and it was because every time they sat down, they were like, I have to write a story that is even better than this story that won all these awards. And it wasn't until I got them, I, I finally, I tricked them. And I was like, I want you to write a story. It's not for publication. It's just for me. And and they produced a perfectly wonderful story. And I was like, ha ha, now we will send this out. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Fucking evil. <laughs> the best trick of all time. Oh it's like it chaotic good. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Chaotic good is a nice way to put it. Oh, dude. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get a little bit into the uh, business side of things. Um, we've mentioned multiple times throughout, and, you know, Kat, you brought this up about writing workshops and the sort of uh, framework that it, it creates uh, for writers about, um, I think a lot of it boils down to expectation, uh, yeah. expectation about what people will accept, expectation about what will sell. When it comes to omniscient stories, uh, I think there are probably a lot of authors who may not be afraid of doing the writing, but they may be afraid of the marketability of it or the ability to sell that story to an agent or an editor um, based on, you know, a fear that nobody wants to read omniscient stories anymore or how many agents are actually going to be interested yeah. in this kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you feel like authors can kind of approach that particular uh, well, the, th the, the thing I would suggest to people is that they not try writing to market. Uh, writing to market is, is just a, a bad idea. You should write the book that you want to read. And you should write the book that you want to write. And you should have fun writing it. And you should just enjoy the heck out of yourself while writing it. Because for two reasons. And, and one is that writing is not highly financially lucrative and so it's good to have a job that you really enjoy right um and the other thing is that um the books that are written with joy the books that are written by people who are writing the books that they want to read those are the books that sell uh i had not sold a book to a major publisher until i wrote you sexy thing 
I mean, I had written, I'd written and sold the small press. Uh, I'd written a bajillion stories, but it wasn't until I wrote this, this book that was basically like, this is the book I would want to read. So uh, write the kind of book that you want to write. Don't worry about the market because other people will have plenty of advice on that thing. So just write the book and then worry about, about the other stuff would be my advice. I think that's beautiful because that's anytime I'm like working with newer writers or whatever, they'll, they'll ask a lot about um, writing to uh, questions oh, yeah. that edge around asking about writing to market. But, you know, you can yeah. tell that's what they're really mm-hmm. asking. And my answer is always to tell them the time frame of when I sold Among Thieves or when I started writing Among Thieves to when it came out. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah. By the time you write the story that you're targeting towards the market right now, the market shall change. Yeah. Um, sure. yeah so I think that's that's really, really good advice. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. Do you have any other advice about omniscient narration in general? Anything we haven't touched on? Anything you've seen? Words of caution, words of wisdom, just catch all. Final I, I'm words. looking at, at my notes. Um, <laughs> you're like, wait, I have, I have, I, I, I do, I do have notes. So, so, um, I think that, uh, omniscient point of view is best suited to an ensemble cast. If you have just like one character you want to focus on, that may not be the the right way to go. I think it's a really good omniscient point. Uh, it's a really good point of view for sort of disrupting the idea of the chosen one because it does focus on community and an ensemble instead of a a single person. I think it uh, it creates a reliable narrator. I mean, because I I have not read unreliable omniscient yet. That would, that would be, it's it's kind of (laughs) my head to think about it. Right. Um, So you do get a more reliable narrator. You do get, I think more elaborate scene setting uh, sometimes perhaps and I think you get freer access to a lot of cool literary devices. Like I'm going to suddenly put a bunch of letters into the thing or, you know, letters that people write as opposed to alphabet letters. Um, <laughs> yeah, the whole book is letters in that way. Epistolary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it's just, it's, it's more fun. I, right now, I'm just thoroughly enchanted by omniscient point of view. I mean, the fantasy novel that I've been working on is not omniscient. It is uh, actually no, it is omniscient. <laughs> it's bleeding like, into everything. Take it back. I'm writing now. <laughs> <laughs> I can never go back. I'm stuck in omniscient. No, no. Uh, but I think I think yeah. If you're if you give it a try and you have fun with it, you yeah. know. I, this is actually something like when I was writing Mushroom Blues, like I started out uh, writing that in third person, uh, wasn't working, switched to fir- first person, and it clicked. So oh, I yes. think if a story is challenging you, don't be afraid to just switch it up yeah. and try a different oh, yeah. narration style. 100%. Um, yeah. Because you never know. And like, then you'll end up with the thing where you go back and edit it and you end up with one chapter that's still in first person. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, at least but it was one chapter. It. At least it was one chapter. That's fine. Yeah. I think I'd written then you, like. Then you fixed it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd written like six chapters of Mushroom Blues yeah. when I switched. Oh no! I, I mean, like, I wrote the whole book and then I switched it from first to third person. Okay. And then when I went back, there was I missed a chapter. Of oh, you, just, just you just missed one. Select all one. and then hit the person key. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That would be beautiful if, if we could do that. Switch, switch POV. Yeah, control. That's what I want AI F. to do. Yeah, right? right, right. That's the only, the only good use for AI, yeah. right there. <laughs> Don't take away our jobs. Make them, make them more fun. Make them easier. Make them easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, on that note, we will wrap up this mini masterclass and our two-parter with Kat. Thank you so much for Thank doing you. this with MJ and I. We really it's appreciate it. It's been amazing. It. Um, as well, for anyone who contributes to our Patreon at $5 or more each month, you can go check out Kat's reading from Rumor Has It. You can also support their work. You know, go check out the short stories. Go check out the Disco Space Opera series. Go sign up for the Rambo Academy for Wayward Writers uh, and become a, a writing Become a superhero. writing superhero. Yeah. Cat, <laughs> um, where can people find you online? 
Um, I am on most social media as at Cat Rambo, uh, and you can go to my website at catrambo.com and find links to all the social media on there. Wonderful. And you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, threads, all that stuff at SFF Addicts Pod. You can go get a copy of Mushroom Blues uh, in paperback, ebook, or hardcover. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me across all the main socials at MJ Kuhn Books. Uh, or you can just find me at mjkuhn.com. You can pick up my interactive story bible journal uh and you get all the links test to out some omniscient narration test out some omniscient, omniscient narration yeah, yeah. And, and take it for a test drive in there um or you can buy my other books there too and feed my vera vera hungry cat thorin thorin food fund he's like 90 percent fur so he is though he's so skinny he needs to get fatter i'm telling you <laughs> he needs a horde he needs like a, a, a mountain horde like erebor <laughs> yeah <Yes. laughs> Help me build Thor and Erebor. There we yes. go. That's the new, that's there the we new go. thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's our new GoFundMe. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts. <laughs>